And there we go. And so it is my pleasure to introduce Amy and let me tell you a bit about her. And also, this might be a good time. Do you all know how to um, switch to speaker mode so that you're not looking at 30 faces, but rather you're looking primarily at Amy's? Um, and I know, Amy, you've got a, a PowerPoint as well, so that will become the, the dominant part of your screen. Uh, but let me tell you a bit about Amy. Amy LaBoy is the Senior Director of Programs at the Greater Chicago Food Depository. In her role, Amy leads teams that develop and execute programs to expand food access across Cook County, while also working with community partners to address the root causes of hunger. Amy has over 20 years of nonprofit experience, specifically in program design and implementation, community engagement, training, capacity building, and fundraising. Prior to joining the Greater Chicago Food Depository in 2014, she worked in disability services, developing programming to promote skill building and community engagement for adults with disabilities. So it is my real pleasure, Amy, to welcome you, um, and we look forward to hearing um, about food justice. Thanks. Thank you so much, Maura, and it is a delight to see all these friendly faces. So I appreciate the opportunity. Um, I, um, I am known to be a talker, so hopefully I'm hitting on topics and um, elements of interest to all of you. But I do hope, that, and while there's definitely structure um, to what I'm about to present, I absolutely welcome questions that um, you may uh, the presentation might provoke or questions that are just burning for you. Um, I do plan to sort of sort of um, talk about our work in three different categories. So there'll be some natural breaks. Um, the first part, we'll, we'll, I'll talk about food access in general, just our work as it relates to the food access piece. But really then talking about some of the strategies that actually tackle um, how we end hunger and what that really means. Uh, and then we'll spend some time on the issues of race equity. And, and there's a lot of obviously intersection um, with all of this work. I'll definitely talk about the work as it is um, sort of pre-COVID, but COVID influences and, the, and everything that has happened as a result of COVID um, and the social um, uh, unjust that has happened you know, over the last year has definitely informed where we are today as well. So it'll definitely, you'll see that influence throughout the different work. So here at the Food Depository, I'm a part of a team that's called Community Impact. And we're the team that is really working closely um, on all of these um, sort of partnerships throughout Cook County to support uh, um, food justice. So when we talk about food justice, Maura, you're right, there is that term food insecurity. And it's an evolution really of that, of that word because food insecurity, you sort of think, you know, it has sort of this, this lens of people who um, don't have jobs and people who are homeless and people that when really we're talking about the justice of being able to have the access to the resources that you need, to live the life that you choose to live, right? When you talk about social justice in any sort of form, it's about making sure people have the access they need to live the lives that they want to live. Um, and food access alone is not the solution. So we, we put it in the context of a greater, um, a greater issue. So that's the context of that. Before I dig into um, sort of the detail, and, I, and you'll see some elements of the presentation that are super high level, but then I'm gonna go deep dive on some specific topics for you as well. Um, but before we start, I'm just going to start with a little video, just an overview, a nice visual of sort of that Food Depository 101. Um, and so I, just learning how to do this, will share my screen and will share the sound so you could hear this video as I present it. Um, and here we go. <laughs> Food. It's the most basic need. More than simple sustenance, food fuels hope and makes more possible. At the Greater Chicago Food Depository, we believe a community's strength, growth, and well-being all start with food. 
So every day, we work to provide food for those in need now and to eliminate the causes of hunger in every community throughout Chicago and Cook County. Now, because of COVID-19, hunger is soaring. In over four decades of feeding our community, we have never faced a need so great. Part of our mission is to address racial inequities' role in hunger. The pandemic is affecting people of color disproportionately, making our efforts even more crucial. With everyone's help, we're facing this new challenge, working even harder, being more nimble. The best part of my job is going out to the communities and seeing the smiles of people's faces. It makes you feel good. We bring food and hope to children, college students, older adults, veterans in need, our neighbors. We help connect people to the benefits they need to get by and create paths out of poverty. But we can't do it alone. Every day, we partner with a network of more than 700 organizations and programs, our generous donors, from individuals to companies and foundations, and passionate, dedicated volunteers. When I volunteer, I'm helping everyone, working people, veterans, people who are homeless, children. Together, we work to bring food, dignity, and hope to our neighbors. Hope starts with food. When we help those most in need go from hungry to hopeful, we truly become a greater Chicago. Great, so I, um, I think that is just a nice visual, just overview um, of the work and you can see, can see it in action. Um, a lot of the imagery of the warehouse uh, is actually where I am sitting today. I'm at our warehouse today. So we have one location. We're right near Midway Airport. And this is the hub of, of where our food comes from. Um, and so at, if you haven't been here at some point, once we're on the other side of COVID, definitely welcome you um, to come out and visit us uh, and take a tour with me. Um, but I'm going to go ahead and launch my presentation now as well. Um, here we go. So <clears throat> Greater Chicago Food Depository is the food bank that serves uh, all of Cook County. So when we talk about food banks, uh, Greater Chicago Food Depository is a part of the national network of Feeding America. And the way that we as food banks work is very much geography. Um, and so we are your food bank of Cook County. Our sister food bank in this region is Northern Illinois Food Bank. Um, so we work as partners, we share borders, we do a lot of obviously support in this you know, northern part of the region together. Um, across the uh, US, there's over 200 food banks um, that cover all the territory known, um, what is known as the United States. So um, we are, you know, uh, as I said, a part of that Feeding American network. Um, and what we do, of course, is provide the food access that individuals who are um, experiencing barriers of access um, are experiencing. And so there's lots of ways that we get food out to our communities and we'll dive into a little bit around that um, shortly. Most, almost all of our work is done through partnerships. So we partner as, as the video outlined, you know, over 200 different programs and partners um, of all types of, uh, of, of sizes and um, all types of missions, but all united in the same mission of making sure that there's food access and providing um, the supports for folks to live the life that they choose to live. Um, and then a big part of the work is, you know, while food access is critical and we support a lot of food need, um, it really is about making sure that we are working to get at that root cause of hunger, which is poverty. It really is that issue of people having the financial stability and income to be able to live the lives that they choose to live, and that we are part of uh, solutions to help support individuals um, in, that, in that 
journey to you know, stability. So when we talk about our work, um, we certainly have some guiding principles and, and you know, obviously with the eye toward food justice, the principles that guide our work is obviously first and foremost, as we've talked about, is making sure that those in crisis have access to the nutrition, the food that they need. A big part of our work is that we are um, very mindful of our role in advancing racial equity, um, especially in our region, um, which has a lot of systemic issues, um, as I'm sure you're all aware about. Um, economic stability is a is a pillar. How, how do we help create solutions that provide economic stability or how do we show up to support solutions that um, provide economic stability? Um, how do we engage and mobilize? So really having that principle of engaging and educating and mobilizing um, toward that, that food justice umbrella. And then of course, investing in people and, and capabilities. So um, we'll talk a little bit more about what this means in the presentation, but you know, as the food bank, we're known as giving food. But again, food is just a short-term patch to the issue. So how do we invest beyond food to make sure people have the supports that they need, the opportunities that they need, and that our partners are built in a way that they have the capabilities to rise up and meet the needs of the communities that they serve. So another framework um, to sort of illustrate our work is just how we approach our work. So again, that bar along the top is just calling out that we do not do this work alone. Our work is primarily done through partnership, that folks that are aligned in mission from the partners we work with to the volunteers that are in, in the network, um, and that there's a lot of partnership that makes this, this work come to life. Um, we are on those pillars of food, making sure that we increase the access to nutritious food and nutrition. We'll talk about that. It's not just about food in general, but it's the quality of food that people have access to. Um, nutrition is a big component of that and being mindful of what healthy means um, and that we are doing work that's what we say unleashing the opportunity in individuals through benefits and employments and really connecting people to the financial resources that they need to, to support them, to support the, the choices that they want for themselves. All of this is to be informed by the community and the voice. It's one thing for us to think what we have the solution, but we don't. Um, we have data and we have experience and we have best practices, but what do people want and need? And what's the, the responses that we should be building to truly meet the needs of those folks that are living their lives every day, making trade-off decisions. And that all of our work, the underpinning should be um, guided by equity and making sure that we are making deliberate choices that support um, those that have um, historically been marginalized and not supported. So, this is a snapshot of this map. These little dots represent, and it's a bit outdated, but this little map, these dots represent the various partners that we have, that we work throughout Cook County. So this is a map of just Cook County. Um, and all those dots represent various partners and programs that we operate. And that actually map is a snapshot of September, 2020. So dots are pretty stable, but they change. Um, and what that, those dots represent are those 700 different programs and partners that we work with. So who are our partners? Um, in terms of food access, our partners, um, when we talk about food access, we have over 450 what we call traditional partners. And so when you think about food insecurity, food access, most people envision that traditional food pantry, the soup kitchen or the shelter, that is working to provide food um, to those in crisis who need access to food. And throughout Cook County, we, we support about 450 different partners that fall in this category. Those partners are all different types, um, all different sizes, um, nonprofit organizations such as a Lakeview Pantry, whose core, core mission is food access to faith-based institutions, um, that are you know, committed in their faith mission to provide you know, two hours of a food pantry every week. 
um, to schools um, and some system partners as well that have recognized uh, themselves as an, a, an anchor in the community and opening their doors to the community. And so there's a lot of different sizes and abilities. Some of those partners are serving thousands of people a week, and some of those partners are serving 100 people a week, but they're all working um, toward mission to ensure that those folks in crisis have access to food. Another pot of our sort of portfolio of partners that we have, we and then there's about 200 to 300 of these partners, we call them sort of institutional or large system partners. So these are schools and health systems or libraries and parks on their residential sites. And I'm gonna dig in on the next slide a little bit more about why and what they represent. Um, and, and, and they represent, you know, basically making sure that we're meeting people where they're at. And I'll talk a little bit more on the next slide. But among our partners too, we recognize that our work continues to evolve and we have this pot of our, our portfolio of people that we work with that are emerging partners, right? So, um, you know, again, is there a specific geography that is having unmet need? Is there a specific population? How do we support a niche population, you know, of older adults? who um, are you know, diabetics or how do we support um, justice involved youth? So there's definitely the, the way to approach those populations are different. It's not a one size fits all solution. So what are the emerging needs of our community and how do we work with community to meet those needs? And I'll talk more about benefit outreach and SNAP in, a, in some future slides, but I think it's really noteworthy that to say that most of our partners, of course, are aligned in this mission because, again, it's about providing people access to choice and benefits and dollars and helping to support individuals in the enrollment of SNAP is a huge, huge um, uh, need and response, and many of our partners engage in that, as well as making sure we're helping to connect people to employment um, and workforce training opportunities. So to talk a little bit more about um, some of those population specific responses. So again, I referenced geography as one of the areas. Um, we have this amazing network of food pantries, soup kitchens and shelters, but we do know that there's gaps in our geography and we may not have a brick and mortar um, location. And so how do we support specific geography if we don't have a partner? And we do that oftentimes through a mobile response um, and our mobile responses are, are basically working to identify a partner to work with us um, to help sort of create what many can call sort of a pop-up market and making sure that, you know, at the end of the day, it's a temporary response that we hope to cultivate in a long-term response that's really reflective of what the community wants and needs. Um, so we, this is um, takes form in two different ways. We have trucks that go out and it's all it is is fresh produce because we do recognize there's definitely parts of our region um, that don't have enough access to fresh produce, or if they do, the price point on such on such food items could be um, prohibitive. Um, and then we have uh, another mobile program, which is both produce and shelf stable items. Um, but but again, we use these as a way to get more produce into a community um, or support into a community that that might not have some strong or enough um, brick and mortar partners. Youth is a huge part of the work that we support. Um, obviously, um, youth are, are, are very vulnerable in, in terms of making sure that they have the food access that they need to, to um, live uh, meaningful and healthy lives. Um, we do a lot of work with schools um, and identifying school partners that help us create programs called Healthy Student Market. So when, you know, when we're not in COVID um, and parents and students are coming to schools, we know we can meet those families at, at a location they're already going, a trusted location, and we create within those schools um, what we call Healthy Student Markets, where it is that pop-up market for that community. And we place those again, it's str strategic recognizing that there are communities that don't have enough access that have high need. And so working with very specific schools around creating that access point for their families. We also do a lot of making sure youth connect to meals when they're not in school. 
And so this comes through um, summer meals and after school meals. And we're, you know, obviously during the time of COVID, there's been a lot of modifications on how these programs have worked. But at the end of the day, you know, youth at, at, at risk of food insecurity, when, when they're in school, they are getting breakfast and lunch. When they are not in school, there is the question if they're really are able to connect to those food resources that they need. So creating those meal programs that allow youth to, to still access that food when they're not in school is critical. During a traditional summer, so pre-COVID, um, we worked with over 240 um, partners across Cook County to ensure that youth could show up to their locations and receive those meals throughout the summer. Um, during COVID last summer, we worked with uh, about 120 programs still, which was still pretty remarkable. Um, what changed in our region last year um, was that schools remained an access point throughout the entire summer as well, which is amazing. Um, and so again, it was it's about us working in partnership with others that are doing the work as well to make sure that youth are having access to those meals. And the same is to be said with after school programs as well. So again, um, working with partners when children leave that traditional school program, maybe they're going to a YMCA after school program or a mentoring program or a park district program. And in that setting, making sure that there's an access to a nutritious meal um, as well as a, a really important strategy. As well as we have a team we call our No Kid Hungry team that works statewide um, and really works statewide to continue to educate individuals, um, institutions, schools on all of the federal nutrition safety net programs. So do, working closely to make sure communities are activating summer and after school meal programs such as us, making sure schools are providing breakfast, breakfast after the bell, making sure there's few, uh, no barriers to access to food for youth in schools when they need it. So lots of work being done there statewide as well from a policy um, and administrative um, lens as well. We have programs that focus specifically on older adults. So making sure again, we're meeting older adults, um, specifically older adults who are um, living um, in um, low income housing. So we have really strong relationships with both Chicago Housing Authority as well as Cook County Housing Authority and work with over a hundred residential buildings, um, making sure that those older adults that live in those settings have access to fresh produce um, and other um, staple items um, and that they're not having to make trade-off decisions about their dollars. Um, so that's a really important program, as well as we work with some senior um, uh, community centers um, to make sure that we have sort of that pop-up market for um, older adults in some of those communities as well. We have um, programs that are focused on just veterans. We work closely with the VA hospitals to provide access to the, to the veterans that show up and are provide services through the hospital systems. Um, as well as we work really closely um, throughout the region with other um, veteran assistance support um, networks um, to provide just ongoing connection to resources and support takes the culmination, not in COVID years, in what ends up being two large events, um, you know, twice a year, different locations that really pull in and, and create a, a resource fair for veterans. So it's a really important population to support. Um, and we're, we're thrilled to be able to do that in partnership with some really great organizations. And then the last nuanced sort of program I'll talk about is that we do have some work that we do specifically with healthcare partners, um, as well as we have our evolving body of work that is our prepared meal program. So again, really working closely to ensure that individuals who are having struggled accessing nutritious food um, get that access. And so how can you take care of your diabetes? How can you, you know, worry about your sodium intake if you can't even, you know, afford the items that you truly are should to be eating? So we have some really specific programs designed around healthcare. We know prepared meals. We started talking about prepared meals pre-COVID, um, but even during COVID that became exasperated just because, you know, being able to have sort of home delivered, healthy, nutritious, tasty um, meals um, was, is an important uh, uh, 
intervention for us that we're continuing to develop. So I could talk about any one of those, any of the programs I've just highlighted for hours, but I will, I will stop there. Um, a couple of fast facts about the work. Um, so each year um, we serve hundreds of thousands of people each year. Um, during the pandemic, we absolutely saw the need increase. And in fact, Feeding America, so our national organization has estimated that um, about 11.8% of individuals living in Cook County will um, experience food insecurity. Now, pre-pandemic, that was it was at 9.3%. Um, so when we're talking about over 600,000 individuals, we're predicting are you know at risk of food insecurity. Um, now, pre-pandemic, it was um, closer to 480,000. So still significant. That number pre-COVID was significant. Now it's even more so. Um, in fiscal year 2020, so for us, our fiscal year is July 1 to June 30th. So as of June 30th, 2020, we had distributed 93 million pounds of food. Um, that's about 30% more than what our normal distribution is. So the prior year, we probably distributed about 69 million pounds of food. Um, when you talk about 93 million pounds of food, what does that mean? Um, some basic conversion is what that means is that's about the equivalent of 77 million meals, um, which, is, which then breaks down to over 200,000 meals a day. That through groceries, through all of our work, all of our partnerships, all of the different channels and ways that food gets out to our community, um, we, we were serving about 200,000 meals a day through our network alone. And let's be clear, we recognize there are people that do this work that are not a part of the network and they are just as critical. So if you're thinking about this as our network, plus what other people are doing, there's huge need that is still being met in our community. A little bit of a visualization um, of this. So here's again, the map of Cook County. The map on the left um, represents the number of, it's a, just that heat map that represents the number of individuals that we served from January to March in 2020, so before COVID hit. From April until June of 2020, the map on the right, of course, then is that increased need. So you can see the high need communities that were high need prior to COVID definitely got hit hard and continued to be high need, but then you do see the shading and the need went up across our entire region. Um, obviously, we know a lot of what's fueled that is unemployment. Um, and so we definitely um, recognize as things are starting to ease up or feel better, we still have to deal with issues of unemployment. So there's gonna definitely be um, a long-term um, impact of of COVID that we'll touch on in a little bit. So what we saw in terms of a statistic is that we saw utilization go up about 120% um, in terms of utilization and the number of people that we serve through our, through our network. Um, to talk a little bit more about our COVID response specifically in terms of food access, um, uh, we've done uh, a lot to work with our partners to invest in their capacity. So we've done a lot of grant giving in this last uh, year, uh, A, making sure that our existing partners, our existing pantry programs had um, the cash flow to continue operating. So we gave out operating grants just here, pay your light bill, pay, pay your staff, um, we know you need this resource during this time of COVID when everyone was hit hard. Um, so we, our grant giving to our partners included some operational grants that were just allocated. Based on equity, there were a couple layers of, um, of, of criteria that went into allocation. But then we also invited partners to apply for what they need to build capacity. Um, so uh, apply for funding to um, improve physical space, um, create more accessibility, create more hours of operation, create more cold storage so they could hold healthier food. So we did a lot of capacity building 
um, in the last year, as well as going back to recognizing we have community areas that don't have all the access that they need, creating um, new partnerships. So inviting um, new organizations that could demonstrate that they are community anchors and building programs that were really wanted and needed by their communities. Um, inviting them to be a part of our network and helping to provide the financial resources to get them started. So that was a big, big part of our investment strategy this last year. It will continue moving forward. I'll talk a little bit about that in a few slides. Um, throughout COVID, we had a lot of new partnerships. So uh, if you heard any of our work over last summer, you heard pop-ups talked about. And so during COVID, we brought on over 50 new different partners in different locations to make sure we were meeting people where the need was. Um, the photo on the screen right now is, is the pop-up that it occurred in Auburn Gresham. Um, and again, it was a hard hit community area, has some good partners there, but still had a lot of unmet needs. And so we worked with um, Greater Auburn Gresham Development Corporation to establish a once a week drive up and walk up pop up model that was seeing about a thousand individuals, a thousand households every week. Um, they have um, evolved and they're still working with us. They are still doing some mobile distributions um, scaled back twice a month, but there's still unmet need. But that's one an example of one of the partnerships that formed because of COVID and continues. Um, be, um, through COVID um, and, and beyond, because again, we know there's going to be continued unmet need um, once we get on the other side of whatever the new norm is. A lot of our COVID response took the form of boxes. So if you know us and you know our work pre-COVID, you know we're all about client choice and people having the opportunity and the dignity to shop and make choices for the resources that they want and need. Um, obviously, because of COVID and safety concerns, a lot of that went to sort of pre-packed boxes of food. Um, and we had an amazing, mighty, mighty network of volunteers that helped us, helped us build boxes. Um, if you know anything about some of the federal response, there was a program that is still continuing at this moment, the um, uh, Farmers to um, families program, the CFAP program through USDA, and there was their boxes of food. So a lot of box commodities to really safely connect people to food resources. Um, again, we look forward to the day and some of our partners are already doing it where we can safely do choice again. It's an important component of our work, um, but the boxes are definitely, it was an amazing response that was definitely needed. And again, Benefit outreach during COVID, again, making sure people were connecting to the financial resources that were available, continues to be critical, even more critical during, uh, during COVID. Um, we have our own benefit outreach team. So we have a team that's dedicated all day, every day to making sure people who need help applying for benefits have that help, both SNAP and Medicaid. Um, and we also work with a network of our partners who are trained and they themselves support folks helping them to get enrolled. And during, um, from March, 2020 to March, 2021, so the last year, that network of staff and volunteers have helped uh, 5,000 uh, households apply for SNAP benefits, which is huge. But again, it was making sure that it was about educating and getting the word out. So often, so much of our work is about making sure we're educating and breaking down preconceptions or stereotypes. Obviously, you know, trying to demystifying um, myths and fear around immigration and can children, uh, you know, all those things are at play, making sure that people and families that are eligible for WIC are accessing it, making sure families are aware of PEBT and the impact that that financial support can have on them on, and their families. So education is a huge, huge part of our work. So that's a lot about food access. I'll do a quick pause there and see if there's any questions about just that transaction of food and connecting people to food. So I don't know um, if there's any, if there, if folks use a chat or if anyone shoots a question. If there's no questions now, that's fine. I think I've demonstrated I can talk. <laughs> it and might be um, because of it being such a big group. I wonder if we should wait till the end just to. Um, 
That's fine. No worries. Then we'll be able, to, uh, be able to see everyone's hands better then too. Got it. Got it. Thanks. No worries. Yeah, we'll keep going. So a lot about food access, right? We it, 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 Critical people need food. We need to make sure they have access to that nutrition. But if we're talking about ending hunger in our community, we want to make sure that people are, um, that we're doing a lot of work. Again, benefit outreach. I can't say it enough. So making sure that, um, that uh, the residents of Cook County who need and are eligible for SNAP benefits are applying for that program um, and also connecting to Medicaid. Um, we, we ourselves, as I mentioned, have a team of individuals that are trained to help people enroll into those benefits and we are doing that every day. Um, but so much about our work too is about educating and advocating. And so WIC, is a really important program. We ourselves are not a facilitator of WIC, but we know WIC is terribly underutilized in the state of Illinois. Um, and so making sure we continue to educate and promote that program is certainly a part of our work. Um, and again, we train anyone that's working with us from a food access point has access and information to all of these flyers and resources. If they themselves aren't helping to apply, help folks apply into benefits, we're making sure they have the information and the referral sources to make sure people have that information. Um, so that's a really important response to the work. Another really important response to the to, you know, and, and ensuring that we have food justice is is employment, is workforce development, um, and making sure that people who are unemployed or underemployed have the abilities, um, support options to, to get meaningful employment. Um, we ourselves have um, some workforce development programs um, and we work with a coalition of many different workforce development programs around, across Cook County. Our programs specifically focus on hospitality, obviously being who we are, food. And so um, those of you that know any of our work pre-COVID, we have a program that's called Chicago's Community Kitchen, which is a 14 week um, classroom based um, uh, hospitality based kitchen, basic kitchen culinary skills, food industry skills. That program is on hiatus because of COVID. Um, and in its place right now is we do have some front of the house um, type of workforce development, which is in our hospitality track. And then we're also just launched this year a supply chain track of workforce development. So we have, we're sitting in, this, I'm sitting in this amazing warehouse that we have. Um, it's over 296,000 square feet. That means nothing to me. I know five football fields. Our building is the size of five football fields. Um, and it's mostly warehouse. And so we have this, and obviously we have trucks in and out every day. You saw some of the visualization in the video of what our warehouse looks like. So what an amazing opportunity to train people in that, in that um, space. And so we have um, launched just this year, um, this supply chain career path program. And again, we recognize there's lots of great um, workforce development programs that are embedded in community that are really meeting people where they're at in the community. So it really is about making sure that we're connecting that information and resources and, and educating folks about opportunity. Advocacy is huge. So I have a counterpart here at the Food Depository who is the Senior Director of um, Policy and Advocacy. Um, and she and her team are working every day to um, educate us, community at large, about the issues at hand. Um, supporting us and how to use our voices. Um, and then on the flip side, obviously working closely to educate legislators and electeds um, on what is critical for the residents that they serve. Um, at the end of the day, um, we, of course, when we talk about advocacy and policy, we're focusing in as an organization on the things that um, are critical to food access and food work. And on this slide, you'll see it's done, it's illustrated in that upper left back block of champion. So these are the programs that we will always champion. We're gonna, we are gonna try to lead the pack to make sure that SNAP is, is, is meeting the needs of our residents and that all of those very food nutrition specific programs were front voice loud, uh, advocating and really um, pushing the, the 
envelope on, on making sure we're meeting the needs of our, our, our constituents. Um, sort of on each of those sides of that heat map, you'll recognize there are a lot of issues that impact food justice, right? And so how do we show up in those spaces to really think about food justice? Um, and what people need. Um, and so while we will not necessarily be the voice that leads it, we will absolutely be alongside our partners and share our voice and our name to the issue. So things like protecting immigrant families, supporting justice involved individuals, anything that's tied to state budget that is gonna be about um, human services. Um, and of course, some of that health and hunger stuff, there's lots of weedy administrative stuff about funding that through Medicaid and you know Older Adults Act and all that kind of stuff. So making sure that we are there alongside those partners and those experts and lending our voice and our support and active. And then we support and monitor. So recognizing there are things that are critical. Again, we will show up. You tell us where to be and what you need us to say and we will be there. I think one of course that pops up and is so critical again, employment and training, minimum wage increases. You know, that's, that's not our area of expertise, but we know how critical it is um, in terms of food justice. So we'll show up um, and monitor and you tell us what you need us to sign and we're there because that's such an important thing and we'll use our voice to help elevate those needs. So that's just a little snapshot. So our, our teams are working really hard um, every day because it is that constant education information sharing, um, both with us who, who are the voices of our electeds, but then you know, really helping to create um, policy change and advocate, advocate within um, that elected system to make sure um, we're doing right by the residents of Cook County. And then the other thing I'll mention in terms of, um, in terms of important, that's not necessarily about food access, but it is about the quality of the food, right? And really focusing on it's not just about food alone, but it's about the quality of food, um, the nutrition of the food that really impacts our overall health. Um, and so we do a lot and have a team in place that really focuses on both the education and support um, of our communities to help provide information. I, we can show up with fresh produce, but if you've never if you've never prepared it, if you've never stored it, if you've never tasted it, are you going to use it? So there's that basic nutrition education component. So the the, the photo here you can see is illustrating um, a, a tasting demo. I'm not sure what that tasting demo is in that picture, but you know, imagine there was eggplant on you know in the produce you know um, that that week, and if you never had eggplant before, it, it's kind of funny looking and how do you even prepare it and to have a taste testing and the recipes and somebody that's helping you to educate is so critical. Um, and so we do a lot within that and a lot within the space of engaging community partners who are doing the work as well. The other thing that's really important to us and is definitely comes through our work is our commitment to the nutrition of our food. So as a food bank many years ago, we came up with a no thank you policy where we're gonna say no thank you to soda candy in terms of our donation pipeline that we really wanted to focus our warehouse holding nutritious food. Um, not that those things aren't things that people should have or want or have choice in, but when we have to make decision about how to use our space, we wanna focus on what are those nutritious foods. So we have a very public facing nutrition policy of what we do in terms of um, our commitment to ensuring the food quality that we distribute to our communities. So that's a little bit about um, some of those other things beyond just food access, how critical it is to really be addressing um, some of those root causes and how we show up to sort of um, amplify the voice around those issues. So let me spend the last few minutes just kind of talking about how the race inequity has showed up in this hunger space. Um, we were talking about um, racial, quality and the inequities in our region before COVID. So that was not, that was not, um, that was something that we were on that journey before COVID started. However, COVID I think woke everyone up and it really became completely uh, illuminated the issues and the problems and the, um, the historic structural racism um, and specifically in our community. Um, I'm born and raised Chicago. I'm a product of the Chicago public schools. 
I know, you know, I know what Dan Ryan, the Dan Ryan represents and how it split up neighborhoods early on. I, I know that, but how do you combat that? And it's just been one of those things. And this year and everything that's transpired in this year from COVID to um, George Floyd and everything that has happened, it has totally just shed a light on all of it um, and really um, challenges all of us to think differently about how we show up and how we make deliberate choices about where we invest and why we invest. Um, and so we know some of the stats here on this slide are really talking about what, what COVID ended up illustrating and the fact that during COVID, um, you know, a lot of the folks that were um, disproportionately impacted were those individuals who were, are, who were black and brown um, and who were living in some of those communities that have had that historic, um, you know, sort of structural racism issues. Um, and so that was not any new news, but what we recognize, it was an opportunity to really think about how can we in our mission work toward achieving race equity. Um, and it, it really put, um, um, we have very much put our stake in the sand to say that we all are going to be very targeted in our investments, that we are going to um, make very deliberate decisions. Now we serve, when you talk about Cook County, we serve, we talk about it in communities, there's 77 Chicago neighborhoods, but of all of Cook County, when you're talking about all of our, our cities and townships, and um, we're talking about 202 community areas. Um, and every community area, there's need. So I absolutely, there, there's need in every pocket of Cook County. Um, and we are working with partners across Cook County to meet those needs. But what we do know is that there are more needs in some of that South and West um, corridor, and that we're gonna make very targeted and specific um, investments in some of those communities to help level the playing field of access and opportunity. And so specifically, oh, this is a map um, that really talks about the purple shading is food insecurity. And then the orange is COVID, um, uh, confirmed COVID cases. And this was October of 2020 that that map represents. So again, we can recognize it's hitting everywhere, but those again, impacts were really um, hitting those communities of color um, on Chicago's South and West Side. Um, and so when, when we talk about the work and we talk about then how are we really making choices to be deliberate and strategic, um, one of the things that we look at when we do our work is to identify, instead of what Feeding America calls is the food insecurity rate, we've developed for ourselves something that we've called our food insecurity risk index. Because for us, what we really wanted to look at is in terms of a, a population, a zip code, a community area, how many households are living at 200% of the federal income, the federal poverty line. We use 200% because at that, you individuals who are older adults and people with disabilities are eligible for SNAP benefits. So that 200% of the federal poverty line, what's the unemployment rate? and what's the percentage of renter occupied. We use that as a proxy for wealth. So that creates the index. So when I talked on this previous slide, the food insecurity index, that purple, those the dark shaded are obviously some of our highest need community. So we took it a step further and we like, we're gonna call it out and say, listen, we're gonna be really deliberate in these 40 priority communities. And so listed on this slide are the 40 priority communities that we are, um, again, we're supporting all of Cook County, but we're paying special attention and being very intentional in these 40, meaning we are staff on the ground. What does the community want and need? Is there enough food access? How is benefit enrollment happening in this community? Do we need more enrollers? Do we need more partners? How are we showing up? How is food access showing up? What are the investments being made into this community to ensure that the resources are here? Who are the, who are the stakeholders? Who are, how's transportation in this region? And not that we're transportation experts, but we should be talking about transportation with those that are transportation experts. So really being very deliberate in these communities. 
And so when we talk about, um, and this is one of my last slides, that when we talk about um, our strategy moving forward, again, our strategy includes that very deliberate investment in community and partners. Historically, pre-COVID, we invested by food, by providing food and providing benefit outreach. But we know folks, partners need more than the food resource. They need the financial stability to run their program. So we're making very much more targeted investments in helping to support and stabilize the infrastructure of our partners, as well as helping create um, new partnerships in terms of that infrastructure. So we will continue with our investments that grow the capacity of existing partners, that will start up new partners and communities that have um, gaps of need, um, and how we you know, kind of um, create responses that are community vision, community desired, um, and so how we show up and make those investments alongside partners um, it will be a big part of our strategy moving forward. Um, yeah, so I think uh, that is um, the overview a lot. Um, we obviously say everyone here has a way to get involved, whether it's at a, at a food bank level or a community level, there's voice, there's ways that each and every person today can, to, can show up for food justice. And I know during the breakouts, you'll have that conversation as well. So I will end there. Amy, thank you. Right on, right on the nose too of eleven o'clock. Um, that was fantastic. It, it was such a comprehensive presentation, and I was not aware of the range of programs that the food depository offered, nor was I aware of how widespread and deep the need is. Um, thank you very much. Why don't we all take a ten-minute break? And then we'll get back together and we're going to go into some small groups for a little bit of time. Thank you again, Amy. Thank you. I please raise your hand and um, we will get we'll get to you. And if you don't see us getting to you, just maybe uh, unmute and speak up. But I see Tom Graham is first with a question. My question is, what is the connection between the food depository and potential health care? activities and screening. For example, if you had a dental technician or a physician's assistant there to identify people who have that need and get them pointed in the right direction. So does anything go on there? Great. That's a great question. So I, I would say there's two different lanes that healthcare shows up in our work. So I talked about the work about nutrition education. What I neglected to say is that it's nutrition and health education. And we're not the health experts, so we're not trying to show up. Right. But we are working with partners to invite them to show up and provide resource tables and information sharing. So oftentimes, especially when we're not dealing with COVID, you might, you know, some of our partners, you would walk in at a food distribution and there would be a table there of, you know, somebody from that community health resource center that's offering blood pressure checks and information about diabetes, whatever that is, those topics of the day. So we do... I have a member of our team that works about cultivating those relationships so that we can make sure that those opportunities, that we're meeting people where they're at with information and resources. On the flip side, mm -hmm. we also have, I was alluding to some of those formal healthcare partnerships where we have partnerships, um, for example, with Cook County Health, with Access mm -hmm. Community Health, that are when patients are actually at their local um, community um, health centers, and they're getting, you know, sort of their, their health check and they're meeting with their physician during that panel of questions. They're getting asked questions that trigger food insecurity or not. And during that, if they are triggering as food insecure, they're getting information and resources in their after visit summary about SNAP, about how to find emergency food. And in some of those situations, we are actually in a partnership where once a month or once every other month, we're showing up. We have a, a team that shows up of volunteers and staff and does basically a farmer's market. So pro fresh produce for those patients that have um, been invited um, uh, to, to, to stop by and get that resource from their health clinic. So it does show up. Health is important, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Great, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Um, and I saw Susan McGowan and then we'll follow after Susan Beth. Um, and be sure to unmute yourself, Susan. 
I saw that uh, in the, your efforts to promote and upgrade food pantries, you want to make them stigma free. And I would love to know what that means. How can you do that? Yeah, it's a great question. So number one, one of the ways that is core pre-pandemic too, but it is that dignity of choice, right? So that you're setting up a situation where it's almost like a shopping experience as opposed to a pre-packed bag. So number one, right off the bat, that's number one. What In terms of bringing on any new sort of pantry programs, we want it to be client choice. We want people to have the opportunity that if you want this item, you can have up to this many of that item, or you don't want it, that's fine, you have that choice. So choice is always, always a, a number one um, way to have um, this an element of dignity and respect, um, which does feed into that stigma thing that I'm somebody in need, but I still get choice. Um, the second thing I will say is we look for our new partners and we talk about stigma free. We want the spaces to be beautiful. We want them to be places that any of us would want to spend time in. So we have some really beautiful examples of spaces that have been created that are shopping experiences. We have partners that give flowers as a part of it because, you know, that's the experience we all have. We walk into our, 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 any of our grocery stores and there's this beautiful flower display. And so it's about making the experience one that's not shameful and more of a joyful experience and a community experience. So we have sites that have murals on the walls and is, you know, clients or guests of those pantries are helping to inform like this is what we want and need. Um, we'd love to see X, Y, and Z. Um, so it's about creating a community around it as opposed to like a, a handout, um, just an experience that is, is communal. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Beth? Uh, in my group, we, we were asking uh, the question about where the food comes from, the partners who provide the food, but also adding on to that, I can't remember where I read this, but maybe in the paper recently, that like something, some huge percentage of the food that's produced in this country, maybe 30% is wasted. Yeah. Uh, and I'm just wondering if the food depository focuses on that at all, or if there's any um, people working on that issue, because, you know, we could be yeah. feeding everybody if we didn't waste that, so much. <laughs> yeah, that's a, a great question. So, um, so number one, how food depository gets a big bulk of its food. So these are rough estimates. About a third of our food um, comes from federal commodities. So somebody in my group asked the question of, do we receive federal funds? We, seem, we receive through USDA some federal administrative funds, but most of our support from federal, about a third of our food is actual commodities that's given to us by the government. Oh. Another third of our food is being sourced from donations straight from vendors. So if you think about Tyson, you think about, you know, sort of corporate um, food industry, uh, about a third is getting just directly donated from them. And then about a third of our food we buy. Um, so we are obviously fundraising and buying. So anything that's showing up in our pantries is coming through that system right now. Um, you know, and, and of course we have pantry partners that are sourcing things locally as well and, and maybe getting other donations beyond us, but a big bulk of it's coming through those, that channel. Mm -hmm. A part of that donations line, so when I said about a third of our donations, a part of that kind of tying back to the food waste question is that we do a program called Food Rescue. Um, so we, you, we work with all the major grocery retailers, so Mariano's, Jewel, um, Aldi, et cetera, so that the products that reach their best buy dates on the shelves, they gotta mm -hmm. pull them off the shelf, they can't sell them, but it's still good food. Mm -hmm. So we have partners that then we pick up or partners pick up that food and so it shows up in food pantries the very next day. Mm -hmm. um, so that's where we intervene with the food waste. The food waste is a huge conversation. I mean, it starts on the farms and how much is being left on the field. Right, um, right. And there's a lot of um, important conversations that are happening in that space. We're showing up, we're doing our part on this other end of it in terms of making sure that what's in our region isn't going to waste or thrown out, but being connected to folks that need it. Cool. Thank you, Amy. Tom? 
Amy, thank you for your uh, presentation. Uh, I actually had a, a comment, uh, not a question. Uh, one of the resources that's on your website that we use quite a bit in my volunteer site is uh, looking up information by zip code to get uh, a list of food depositories in a particular area. It's something that we use in conversation. We also can give copies of that to our clients. So I just wanted to mention to everyone that if you're in your ministry work, if you need access to local uh, food pantries, if you don't know where they are, there's great uh, information available on the Chicago Food Depository website. Thank you, Tom, for saying that. Um, I should have had a slide about that because yes, it is an important referral source. And since you so actively use it, I will give you a heads up. It's gonna change look in the next month and become much more robust. And down, down the line, the vision is that um, that resource will also share additional information about each of those partners because many of those partners provide services beyond food. Catholic Charity Pantries is a great example of that. There's a lot of other social service activities that can happen there. So over the next year, that site will become more robust and a, even a more meaningful referral source. But in the basic right now, you have somebody that asks you, hey, I need help. You can go to our website. There's a button right on the front page. It says find food. You click on it. You type in a zip code and it's going to pull up all the partners that we work with um, that have distributions for the public. Thanks, Thank Tom. And this is a tiny thing, but I live in Evanston and they just started a community refrigerator, which I guess are popping up in lots of places where it's an out outdoor refrigerator and shelving. Mm -hmm and you can drop off food to put there and then people just know that it's available uh, to take if needed. Yeah, um, and the, the organization that's leading a lot of the work is called Love Fridge. I think if that's a Love Fridge, I know there's a couple different models, but um, a really, you know, that's a great community program. We don't partner directly with them, but we do know they're a part of that ecosystem and a really important one, right? So that if I have a food item that I don't need, I could put it in this shared community space um, and somebody that needs it can go get it, right? And so um, I know that the staff of Love Fridge makes sure they mobilize volunteers to ensure it's clean and food safe and all that. Um, again, it just represents that there's a lot of great work happening um, in the ecosystem um, of you know, food access, food justice. Yeah, and these were a few 20 year olds, I think that's got it started here in Evanston. I yeah. know there's two comments that you might want to check out, Amy, in the chat to see if you want to respond to those. Sure. Um, anyone else have a hand raised? I can't see. Oh, oh, yes. So how about Ann Garvey and then Sharon? I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit more about your culinary training program, whether you foresee that starting back up perhaps this summer, how many people you serve if they're placed in employment afterwards? Yeah, absolutely. So I'll start with the back end of that question because it's easier. Anyone that goes through our um, employment programs do receive placement and post-placement support. So we definitely work with a robust network of employment partners. So not only do you, you know, we hope that you're building skills that lead to your employment, we're going to help you find that employment. Um, and so um, you know, we definitely have a really good placement rate um, and retention rate. So we, you know, definitely some of the metrics in that work is, you know, what's your retention rate a year out. Um, and pre-pandemic, um, it was over 90%. So we have a pretty good rate um, of making sure that people are successfully matched with meaningful employment and it's for the long term. Something that's important for us as a workforce development program is that we're working to connect our priorities to try to connect folks that go through our programs to employment that not only offers the salary, but benefits as well. So that's a key component that doesn't always follow through. Um, doesn't always happen, but it's certainly a priority for us to make sure it's not just employment, but there's an opportunity for continued support through other benefits as well as continued advancement. We are running our workforce development program, as I said, via the warehouse um, training program, as well as our front of the house. The kitchen culinary program, our 14-week in the kitchen, hands-on intensive, um, they're looking at it. Um, I'm not sure when it'll start. It will come back, yes, um, but I'm not sure when yet. Um, they're still, obviously, we're still working through COVID. They're working on some modified versions of what can be in classroom, out of classroom. So we're probably a, a, a little while out from that. But in the meantime, we do have some really great, robust 
um, front of the house training and the warehouse training. And just recently, we're awarded some great grant support to provide hourly wage for those participants, which isn't always something that happens in a, in a de workforce development program. So um, I can definitely make sure. Um, I think there's a lot of on our website, but we can send some flyers and stuff too. Thank you, Sharon. I think you were next. Well, um, hello, thank you for your presentation. I really enjoyed it. Um, one of the things that I believe was in the uh, video that you showed was uh, the education part. Um, uh, someone was standing at a table explaining what an eggplant was. Um, and um, I was wondering whether you have any uh, written materials and this would have to be in uh, English and Spanish, related to um, answering or explaining what certain foods are. Uh, because I could see someone opening a box and uh, thinking about what am I gonna do with this eggplant? Um, and um, it, it would be, uh, I think a nice idea that when in this box there's an eggplant or there's a head of cauliflower mm -hmm. um, for some tips on what you could do with it, how to cook it, you know, and maybe some uh, also some information about its nutritional value. Um, yeah. So. Yes, so the short answer is yes, we do. Um, number one, obviously COVID's taught us a lot, so we're trying to get much more online forward-facing for general public. So I know um, my colleague who runs our nutrition education work is actually uh, working on a project now that puts a lot more front-facing on our public website. So there'll be more to come in the months ahead for anyone to access. Right now, we do have anyone that partners with us has access to an online portal as a partner. And so they can log into the system and pull resources. So information sheets, nutrition sheets, recipe cards um, are definitely a part of that uh, resource. And so one of the things you that photo captured is on the table, there's like half sheets of paper. One side is all the information about eggplant. Why is it important? How do you store it? How do you cut it? And then on the flip side would be the recipe that they just tasted, right? So there's that, there's recipe cards. We have over, mm, I think they have close to 200 recipe cards in English, definitely. Most of them in Spanish. That's definitely a part of our journey. We wanna get more languages and be more culturally appropriate um, with our recipes and our languages. So things like that are in, in process and definitely continue to build. Thank you, Amy. Thank you. Um, Beth, before I call on you, is there anyone new that hasn't had a chance to ask their question? Speak up in case I can't see you. Oh, Maureen Garvey, do you have a question? Maureen Garvey. You're on mute though. You're on mute. All right. I wondered I about a question. I wondered about areas that are called food deserts, and it does this. Does any is anybody working to? Uh, I don't know if that's legal situations or to, to expand grocery stores in areas where there's food deserts. That's a great question. Um, so I'll show you and I'll explain. I'll, I'll provide an example of how that shows up in our work. Right. So. Um, one of, I'll, I'll be really specific actually, one of our community areas is Austin. I'm sure you're all aware of that community area in the city of Chicago. Um, they actually have a community organizing group um, uh, called Austin Coming Together. Within Austin Coming Together, they have a subgroup that is called Austin Eats. That group is a cross section of case of stakeholders, community residents, we're at the table, other pantry, some of our pantry partners are at the table. Um, food industry is at the table, grocery retail is at the table. So they are, as a community organizing group, talking about what our community needs in terms of retail, 
um, farmers markets, emergency food system. Um, so yes, when you, so it is happening. Um, it's not always happening equally across all communities of, you know, of course, different communities, um, you know, have different um, organizing groups, et cetera, but there is definitely a lot more intentional discussions around just that. What does a community really want and need? Um, there's a lot more attention placed on community development plans um, and thinking about it, um, you know, from a big picture about what's missing and what's needed. Because then you go down the, you know, not only is, is there a need for retail, but what's the transportation system that supports that retail access? And, um, you know, what's the safety plan around it? So it really is, um, there's some really robust community organizing groups that are tackling such issues. Uh, and it's an important one to talk about, right? Because it, it shouldn't just be about emergency food, it should be about a robust network of choice, um, meeting people where they're at and what they need. Thank you. We only have about five more minutes. So um, I think Camille has her hand up. Oh, do you? Thank you. Thank you, Beth. <laughs> I don't know how to put the hand up there. That's uh, okay. Anyway, my question is, I mean, I know you can't give me an answer on this, but it sort of came up in our discussion too. I think we're very lucky, very blessed that things like IVC or Meals on Wheels or any of these things have opened up our eyes as ways to serve. And that, that's wonderful. But how do we go the next step to work about actually changing things uh, that these situations you know, improve? Even, you know, Amy, it was a wonderful presentation, but when we, when I hear things like we have all this stuff on our website, all this information, there are a lot of people that don't have access to a computer, to uh, a smartphone. And, you know, I mean, I have no idea. It's not, that's not a criticism. I'm just saying. No, you're right. Much you're of right. This stuff is there, but I mean, I have friends right here who have smartphones. They don't know how to answer them. <laughs> You, know? you are absolutely right. Um, and these are things that we talk about every single day because it's not, there's just not one way. We have multiple prong ways that we have to reach people. Um, and it's not a one size fits all. So while the website, you're all here on the computer with me. So it's a safe thing to say that you probably can go to the website. I know, I know that. But if I were to show up at a community group, I might show up with flyers. I'd show up with a card that has our phone number um, that you can call us if you need help. I'd show up with a list of all the community organizations that I know work in your community so I can help refer you. Um, there's not any one way. And I think um, one of the biggest things that we talk about our work uh, is that more often than not, people just don't know. Right? They don't know what question to ask. They don't know what's actually out there as a resource. And so one of the biggest things that I feel like any of us can do is just help to continue to spread the word and educate. When we ask parents um, how they find our summer meal locations, right? So we, I talked about pre-COVID, we had 250 meal sites for kids to show up and grab a meal. The number one referral source of how people found it was word of mouth. It wasn't a flyer, it wasn't a website, it's people talk to each other and they're sharing that information and resource. So I think the biggest tool that everyone on this call has is your voice um, and how you show up and where you show up um, in terms of your support and your dollars um, and your votes um, in terms of the issues that really uh, impact the food justice. Thank you. One final question. Um, I get back to you. Um, well, I, I kind of to follow up on that, actually, I, I work with at my parish with a group, uh, St. Vincent de Paul group, that mm -hmm. we meet with people in our community who are having some kind of a cash shortfall for you know multiple reasons and lots more during COVID, and we provide them with resources, you know, in addition to a little bit of help financially, but um, I wondered how we would put those people in touch both with your workforce development thing, which I think you said is on the website, but also um, you mentioned something else that I thought, wait, what was it? 
Oh, referrals for benefits outreach. Mm -hmm. How would people um, get in touch with that if they if they need to access help? Yeah. So one of the things I can do post this more if it's okay. I'll send you an email with a bunch of flyers, um, and it, it, they're built that they're just going to be regular size paper that you can choose to print off. They're in color, but they're intentionally built that if you print them in black and white, they're going to still look all right. You know. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, we can certainly quickly get that because that that is a, a great resource of just information sharing um, on the ground and with people because you hand somebody something um, it is all on the website so if you you know if there is somebody that needs help connecting to benefits our benefit hotline number is on the website call schedule an appointment talk to somebody live that happens the workforce development too. Um, there's flyers about how to, you know, enroll and all that kind of stuff. So I'll make sure in the after, you know, post call to send along just uh, some of that those information sheets. Um, but again, the website for you all certainly can be a referral source. Um, Mara has my contact information. You could reach out to me, and if I don't know the answer, I'll connect you with the person that does. Um, but yeah. Amy, thank you. Thank you. Um, how many full time staff are there? for the food depository? Well, that's a great question. We're over 200, but about half of that are our operation workers. So our warehouse workers and the truck okay. drivers, et cetera, right? So on any given day, we're making several hundred deliveries and pickups um, of food. Um, so the biggest bulk of our team is our operations. Um, the next biggest team is the team that I'm a part of. It's all the, diff the staff that are working in the community with partners um, and helping to support them in their missions. It is such a big organization and such a big multi-layered problem as, as you've introduced us to. So thank you very much for spending the two hours with us. Um, and whatever you want to send me, I'm happy to pass on to all of our service core members. And are you comfortable with my um, giving them your email? Should you, they have questions? Absolutely. Great. Absolutely. Thank you. Yes, um, it was a pleasure. Thank you. And everyone, thank you for being here, um, especially to the, the alumni who are visiting with us. It's been nice to have you. Um, a few ending announcements. Um, I will be in touch about our May retreat, which is on the, I'm getting my days confused, the 19th from 10 a.m. till noon virtually. But then we'll be in touch too about our June meetings, which will be in person. I'm happy to report. Jackie is working on that and getting the details. Um, and then finally, save the date. I'll send this to you as well. Our morning of reflection, which will be taking place on July 29th at St. Ignatius College Prep with Father Dick Bauman will be joining us um, to present. So we're looking forward to that. And I hope to see you all on April 25th um, at our webinar with Mike McGillicuddy and EJ Dion. So thank you one and all. Um, as we close our large meetings typically, um, let's come together for our final song, which is, and prayer, these alone are enough for me. Thank you, everybody.
darkness falls on my father.